Well, welcome everyone to a meeting of the Better Met <laughs> Sorry. Boston Metropolitan Planning Organization. I'm David Moeller, Prince Secretary Pollock here. I'm um, Secretary Pollock. Secretary Kessler here. Can you put the, there you go. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. Please do not unmute or mute yourself. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. Find this by clicking either on the particip participants button at the bottom of the screen, or a, and a window will pop up with raise hand button at the bottom, or the reactions button in the toolbar. The chair will then call on you uh, or call on the participants. <clears throat> if you are on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Rosine Foley via the chat box at R. F O L E Y at ctps.org or by calling her at 857 702 3704. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA Standards and Revised Section 508 Standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Rosine Foley of the MPO staff at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. First item on the agenda is introductions. I'm David Muller and I represent Secretary Tesler here. Please call the roll. Okay, MassDOT uh, C2. John Bashad representing Highway Administrator Jonathan Gulliver here. Great. Uh, Mass DOT Highway Division. John Romano here. Uh, MBTA. Jillian Linnell on behalf of General Manager Poftac. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Massachusetts Port Authority. Okay. Uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Good morning. This is Eric Barassa with MAPC. MBTA Advisory Board. Good morning, Brian Kane from the MBTA Advisory Board, present and accounted for, sir. Thank you. Uh, Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Leonard Diggins from the MPO Advisory Council here. Thank you. Uh, City of Boston, BTD. Phil Conroy representing the City of Boston, as well as uh, Mayor Kim Janey. Thank you. Uh, City of Boston, BPDA. Hello, Jim Fitzgerald with BPDA representing uh, Mayor Janey and the City of Boston. Uh, at large city of Everett. Jay Monty representing Mayor Di Maria and the city of Everett. Thank you. At large city of Newton. David Kozis representing Mayor Fuller in the city of Newton. Thank you. At large town of Arlington. This is Daniel Amstutz, uh, Town of Arlington, representing Select Board Chair Steve DeCorsia and MPO Area Towns. Thank you. Uh, at large, Town of Brookline. Heather Hamilton for the Town of Brookline. Thank you. Uh, Intercore Committee, City of Somerville. Good morning, uh, Tom Bent, City of Somerville, representing uh, Mayor Joe Curtatoni in the Inner Corps. Thank you. Uh, Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Town of Acton. Okay. Uh, Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Satcha Kiza, representing Mayor Spicer, Metro West. North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Okay. 
Okay, North Suburban Planning Council, City of Woburn. Okay, South Shore Coalition, Town of Rockland. Uh, Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. E. Pelletier, Town of Medway. Thank you. And Three Rivers and a Local Council, Town of Norwood and Neponset River Regional Chamber. Good morning, Tom O'Rourke, uh, Town of Norwood, representing the Trick subregion. Thank you. And uh, our ex officio members, uh, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, Ken Miller, Federal Highway. And uh, Federal Transit Administration. Okay. And I think I just saw. Uh, North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly, uh, just come on board. Yep, Darlene Wynn, City of Beverly, on North Shore. Thanks. Okay, uh, that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Next item on the agenda is the chair's report, and I don't have one, so we'll go directly to the executive director's report. Peggy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to um, give you all an outreach highlight <clears throat> that recently we had a Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP, open house on Tuesday, July 20th, and I wanted to thank you all. Staff wanted to thank you, um, those of you who attended. And at that meeting, Sandy Johnston, who is the UPWP manager, presented on the background of the UPWP, how it relates to the MPO's goals, and um, also talked about each discrete study that is being proposed for the federal fiscal year 2022 UPWP. Um, if you'd like to um, see more about it, there's a recording um, on the Boston Region MPO's YouTube channel. And there's also, of course, the draft UPWP document available on the MPO's website. Um, we will be accepting comments from both MPO board members and of course, um, members, any members of the public through August 13th, 2021. Um, so please submit them to Sandy Johnston, or you can call him at 857-702-3710, or you can use our feedback form available online. So that's um, that's all we have for, for outreach highlights. Um, today, we're going to be asking you to approve a non-MPO funded work scope for the MBTA. Um, just as a reminder, as always, we are asking you to approve these non-MPO funded work scopes when they involve a significant amount of effort for staff and so that we can assure you um, that we can still carry out our MPO work. And I think sometimes you find those work scopes also just interesting from your perspective and the region's perspective. Um, this one, which Bradley Putnam is going to talk about, is to support the Writer Oversight Committee um, or the ROC. Then after the work scope, we'll also ask you to vote to release the federal fiscal year 2021, that is the current UPWP amendment one. Um, and we will also ask you to um, shorten the public comment period from 30 to 21 days. And we will discuss that with you. Sandy Johnston um, will be up on the agenda to talk about that with you. And then the rest of today will be on three staff presentations. The first is an update on the CBD phase two report. CBD stands for Central Business District. And then the second, um, we'll review the results from the MPO elections survey that was conducted earlier this year. And then finally, um, we'll present on the Route 28 Priority Corridor study in Milton, which was one of the um, priority corridors that was identified in the LRTP, the Long Range Plan Needs Assessment. Um, so that's today. Um, our next meeting will be on August 19th. Um, during that meeting, we will um, ask you to vote to endorse um, and approve the F federal fiscal year 22 tick, the one for the upcoming year, with the, um, which I just um, talked about the amendment. This is separate. This is the upcoming years. 
We will also ask um, or talk to you about an update to the MPO public outreach plan and um, follow that with um, just discussing with you and confirming your intent for how you would like as a board to hold your meetings while the exemptions for the open meeting law requirements are extended to April 1st. And that is all, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Taking Any questions for taking from the members? Seeing none. Next item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment at this time? If so, please raise your hand or dial star nine. Seeing and hearing none, if you want to comment during the meeting, let us know and we will call on you. Next item on the agenda is committee chair's reports. Are there any? Ben Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wanted to update the MPO board that the UPWP committee meet, did meet this morning. Uh, and the primary purpose of our meeting was to, to discuss the UPWP Amendment 1 to, for federal fiscal year 2021. Uh, that's agenda item 8 on the MPO meeting today. And we did recommend that the MPO release that for public comment. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Any questions for Ben? Seeing none. Eric Barrasso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also wanted to report that the, um, the ad hoc uh, project cost uh, increase committee met um, last week and we had a really great uh, conversation honing in on potential sort of three areas of recommendation. One being about um, programming projects at a, at a higher level of readiness um, on, for, for the TIP. Another one around sort of requirements for project proponents to come and present more information on a regular basis to the MPO and certainly when projects go up in cost. And then uh, we are gonna uh, now focus in on a potential third recommendation, um, which would be around um, doing some type of uh, cost effectiveness uh, evaluation when a project goes up in cost. And so, those are kind of the three areas that we're, we're focusing in on for some type of recommendation. The next meeting is on August 19th. I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that we can um, come up with a conceptual recommendation at that meeting. And then we'll likely need at least one other meeting in September um, to hopefully reach consensus on, on something to bring back to the full MPO. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eric. Any questions for Eric? Seeing none. Before we go on, I see that Senator Timothy is in the office in the audience. Senator, if you would like to comment, please feel free or let us know. Next up is the Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Then. Sorry for the delay, Mr. Chair. I was just waiting for the unmute signal. Uh, so uh, the advisory council has not met since um, our, our last um, MPO meeting, but our next meeting is going to be on the 11th. And at that meeting, we will be discussing our, our letter uh, to the MPO on the UPWP. Uh, we'll also be wrapping up our uh, review of the last needs assessment, chapter 10 of that. And, and we'll also discuss um, some ideas for um, future meetings. So we welcome you to attend, especially for that last part. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Any questions for Lynn? Seeing and hearing none. Next item is the MBK Rider Oversight Committee Work Scope. Bradley Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to present a scope for the MBTA Rider Oversight Committee support. The schedule for this project is four years. The budget is $31,000, and the MBTA will pay for this project. The purpose of this project is to support the MBTA's Rider Oversight Committee. The MBTA established the Rider Oversight Committee in 2004 to provide ongoing public input on a variety of different issues, including strategies for increasing ridership, developing new fare structures and prioritizing capital improvements. The Rider Oversight Committee meets once a month. It also has two subcommittees that also meet once a month for a total of three meetings per month. For many years, CTPS has provided technical support to the Rider Oversight Committee, and the MBTA has asked CTPS to continue providing that support. Over the past several years, the assistance that CTPS has provided has included offering insights into the MBTA's planning process, 
uh, providing data analysis and attending committee and subcommittee meetings at which CTPS staff can respond directly to questions from members of the Rider Oversight Committee. And under the scope, CTPS would continue doing that work. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'd like to ask the board, please vote to approve this scope. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Any questions for Brandon? Seeing none, can I get a motion in a second to approve the scope as presented and please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Leonard Diggins, and I am the representative in, uh, on the advisory council from the Pride Rosa Committee, and I wholeheartedly uh, recommend that uh, we approve this work scope. Thank you. And Daniel Amstead. I'm Daniel Amstead, Star Ronington. Uh, I'll second that. I just had a quick question as well. Okay, go ahead, Daniel. Ask your question before we vote. Thank you. Um, I was just, I didn't realize this. So this is this is for over uh, four years. So just this 30,000 for a four year period, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so it's spread out over the four years. As you know, the um, overhead rate changes each year, but so it'd be roughly $6,000 a year, for the six or 7,000 for the next four years. Okay, I think I was just surprised. Um, that seems like, not a whole lot of money over four years, but I guess is it mostly, I guess what I understand is attending meetings and participating within the Rider Oversight Committee. I know the, the work scope, I think mentioned some, sometimes analysis of things that come out of the Rider Oversight Committee. Is that correct? Yeah, you're right, Dan. The, the primary commitment is attending the meetings. And then there's also analysis as needed, but you're right. This is a relatively small dollar scope compared to many of the others that we've been to you. Is the, those, those analyses, do they come under this scope or would they sort of end up somewhere else? So it, it depends on what's needed. Um, if there was something specific for the committee, it would go under this scope. But if there's something related to some other project, it might be charged to a different project. It would depend on the situation. Okay, thank you very much. So the motion has been made and seconded. Ariel, please call the roll. Or Jonathan, please call the roll. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, David Muller? Yes. John Bouchard? John Bouchard, yes. John Romano? John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell? Jillian Linnell, yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane. Uh, Brian Kane, I'll abstain. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Bill Conroy. Bill Conroy, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Ben. Nope. Can somebody unmute Tom? Uh, Tom oh. Ben, yes. Thank you. Uh, Thatcher Keezer. Thatcher Keezer vote yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Next item on the agenda is the Federal Fiscal Year 2021 UPWP Amendment Number 1, Sandy Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. I am here to ask your approval to release Amendment 1 to the current Federal Fiscal Year 2021 Unified Planning Work Program for public comment. 
the UPWP committee met this morning, as you heard from Ben Muller, uh, to discuss this amendment and voted to recommend that the NPO release it for public comment. Just to be very clear, this is the current document that governs the NPO's current budget running through the end of September, not the 2022 version that is also currently out for public comment. You'll remember that staff typically bring an amendment at the beginning of or during the fourth quarter of any given federal fiscal year to adjust budgets and sometimes content within the UPWP to reflect changes that have happened during the year and allow us to close out the year strongly and efficiently. For federal fiscal year 2021, uh, the Federal Highway Administration has required any change of 10% or greater to a single budget line to be contained in an amendment. But overall, these changes are budget neutral, and you will see that the top line numbers programmed in the UPWP have not changed. There are a couple of accompanying materials to help explain this amendment. You can refer to any of them, but the table, which we are also showing on the screen, is the neatest for summarizing the changes concisely. A short memorandum summarizing the process, reasoning, and need behind this amendment, uh, and including the table that you see on the screen as well, um, is posted to the MPO meeting calendar. There is also an updated version of the Federal Fiscal Year 2021 UPWP as it would be if this amendment is endorsed. As always, it's important to remember that UPWP budgets are developed far in advance. In this case, these budgets were initially finalized around May of 2020. Throughout the fiscal year, MPO staff track spending on 3C line items and report quarterly to the UPWP committee using a schedule of operations. At the end of third quarter, MPO staff complete a thorough assessment of the spending patterns in the year to date and propose a slate of budget adjustments or modifications for the final quarter. There are several reasons that we may be asking for these changes. Uh, the major one is changes in project or line item need that evolve or emerge as the year goes on. Uh, this year, as you can see in the comments column of the uh, table, many of the needed changes relate to COVID-19 and its impact on our work. There's also staff attrition and the time that it takes to recruit and train new staff. When people resign from CTPS, there's almost always a gap before a replacement is hired. While we use and reallocate staff capacity as flu fluidly as possible to meet project need, staffing gaps can result in lower expenditures than initially expected on 3C line items. Finally, in addition to changes to work by CTPS, this amendment contains a minor adjustment to a couple of subtasks in Chapter 7 the section of the UPWP funding allocated to MAPC. The details are included in the memo. Because this modification does not change the top line number for any UPWP task, uh, it is not captured in the table and does not change any budget tables within the document itself. I and other staff from CTPS and MAPC are happy to field any questions you may have about process or project specifics. If you're satisfied, we request that you release this amendment to the FFY 2021 UPWP for a public comment period. We also request, as Tegan mentioned earlier, that you vote to shorten the public comment period from this amendment for this amendment from 30 days to 21, which will allow us to schedule endorsement for an earlier meeting and bring the public comment period into conformity with the practice expected to be adopted as part of the MPO's draft new public participation plan, which will be presented to you soon. Thanks, Sandy. Questions from the members? Seeing none, I need a motion and a second to release this for a 21 day public comment period. And as Sandy noted, our rules require a 30 day comment period for the UPWP and its amendments, but give us the authority to waive that and reduce it. And if we don't reduce this one, we won't be able to spend all this money before the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th. So can I get a motion and please state your name for the record, Tom Bent. Uh, I'd, I'd make that motion. Eric Barasa. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Motion having been made and seconded to release this for a 21 day public review process. Please call the roll, gentlemen. David Moeller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Eric Barasa. Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane. Brian Kane, yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Bill Conroy. Bill Conroy, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. 
Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Ben. Tom Bent, yes. Patrick Keezer. Patrick Keezer votes yes. Darlene Wynn. It looks like Darlene has left the meeting. Okay. Um, Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the report on the access to central business district phase two study, Betsy Harvey. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to give an update today on the Central Business District Phase 2 study. Uh, the study pulls together research on the impacts of COVID-19 on transportation, jobs, and business districts, and synthesizes that into potential recovery scenarios in one guidebook. Uh, and unlike other related research, the guidebook will be grounded in the experiences of 12 CBDs profiled in our region and the work that they've done to address COVID in their CBD so that others can learn from their experiences. Because the scope of the study has evolved since it was proposed in the UPWP, it, it has a uh, as has the trajectory of the pandemic, the framing of the final guidebook that we produced at the end of the study is still in process. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm here to talk to you today, get your input on how we propose to frame the guidebook. Uh, could I get uh, control of the screen, please? Thank you. So with that in mind, I'd like to get your feedback on a few quick key questions at the end of the presentation. And so I'll just pose them here so that you can think about them as I'm talking. So I'll be talking about some of the themes that we've heard in our interviews. And so we wanna know if other themes that we haven't covered are also important for you. I'm also going to present a proposed recovery scenario framework. And so I wanna know, is that a useful framework or do you, do you think that it meets the goals of the study? And finally, is there other information that would be helpful in a recovery guidebook? There we go. So to give you some backgrounds, so we're all on the same page as to where we started and where we are. Two years ago, we undertook the CBD-1 study where we looked at characteristics of CBD customers at three different uh, CBDs in our region, including how they get there and the kinds of activities they do in those CBDs. And the study also developed a methodology to identify and classify Boston region CBDs. Now, the original purpose of phase two was to expand on phase one by conducting surveys in a new set of case study locations in order to build a larger sample data set. However, last fall, as we were writing the scope for phase two, we realized that we could not survey the survey folks in the way that we envisioned due to the pandemic, of course. So with your approval, we adapted the scope to focus on COVID impacts on CBDs and related transportation impacts and changes, as well as developing recovery scenarios as we were not yet at that time, back in the fall, at, in recovery. So where are we now? We are wrapping up our stakeholder interviews uh, regarding the 12 CBDs that I mentioned where we're focusing on. And next week, we'll be hosting a focus group with community-based organizations about the challenges that they're facing um, in their communities and strategies that have 
and interventions that have worked during the pandemic. And during these conversations that we've had so far, we've gotten a lot of input on the transportation and business challenges in each CBD uh, during the pandemic and into recovery and strategies and actions that they've undertaken to support their businesses through transportation investments. And working on the creation of a guidebook to pandemic recovery, which will include a recovery framework, case studies of those 12 CBD locations, and lessons and takeaways and resources for other municipalities. So which and CBDs did we select and how did we do that? So as I mentioned, we selected 12 in 11 different municipalities based on a variety of different factors. And the ones we selected are shown on the map. So you kind of see the brown area are the municipality in general. And if you squint a little bit, you can see the, the CBDs that we'd identified through the first study uh, and, uh, and, and where they're located. They're kind of the dark, the little darker areas um, in the municipalities. So we selected them based on several different factors. We considered the level of transit access, which was defined in our first study. So for example, commuter rail versus only bus service versus no public transit service. We looked at one to select CBDs that had a relatively high number of jobs that could theoretically be performed remotely compared to the number of households. We also considered the equity populations in the CBDs. We looked at the, the pandemic impact, for example, caseloads that were higher in some areas than in other and others. We also considered input from MPO staff and board members to get information about local knowledge of these communities and try to select communities that we hadn't had uh, that haven't often been part of MPO studies in the past. And then we also looked at geographic distribution and try to get a representative sample of different types of communities. So while we didn't hit every factor perfectly, we got a pretty good representation of the different types of municipalities in our region with the hope that anybody could pick up the guidebook and, and recognize kind of a municipality that is similar to theirs. So I want to switch gears now to some of the themes that we've heard in our interviews so far. And we are, just to be clear, we're, we have one interview left. So this is 11 of the, of the 12 interviews. Um, we've heard that there's an accelerated demand for pedestrian and bicycle facilities as interest in, in those has have increased during the pandemic and in recovery. We've heard about the importance of state, and state funding and technical assistance programs to support quick build investments. We've heard that transportation investments during the pandemic focused on supporting changing business models such as takeaway and delivery options. We heard a lot about how important and helpful it was to be flexible and creative and perhaps not following the same status quo processes that had been done before. We also heard a lot about the strong relationship between transportation, placemaking and supporting businesses. For example, turning parking spaces into parklets gave uh, municipalities an opportunity to enhance the downtown with public art and draw people to local businesses. And finally, we've heard a lot about how important it can be to invest in your town's strengths. For example, if your town has a lot of outdoor tourist attractions, focusing on those to support businesses and figuring out how to strengthen transportation to support those, um, uh, those strengths. Oops. So a lot of the themes we're hearing are also goals of this MPO, for example, increasing active transportation and supporting public transit. But also on the other hand, there are trends that we don't wanna see such as increasing congestion. And so what our research is telling us is that there is an opportunity to shape where we go, which fits in with what we've heard of from a lot of our interviews. And can we capitalize on some of these changes brought on by the pandemic? We have a chance to work towards reducing some of the negative trends we're seeing and consider what kinds of policies and investments we can put in place so we don't go back to some of those pre-COVID trends while supporting other positive trends that are new or accelerating. And so what we hope this guidebook can do can help to, is to help um, support these efforts and identify them for municipalities as well as hopefully for this MPO as well. So with this in mind, we are proposing this recovery scenario framework that you see on the screen. This is a, an example. It's not kind of our set in stone. It's just kind of how we want to plan on setting up 
that recovery scenario framework. And so rather than identify a series of specific recovery scenarios, since we are already well into recovery, this framework is meant to be flexible and adaptable. Within each category on the far left, we've identified strong trends that we're already seeing. And as we move to the right, there are big unknowns that will affect the future of transportation and driving forces that will likely affect the direction and magnitude of these unknowns. And then on the far right, we see some possible transportation interventions. Now, if this framework looks familiar, it's because it, it may, may actually be so. It's adapted from scenario planning that is used in long-range transportation planning and other, other types of long-range efforts to better understand what the future could hold and identify strategies for adapting to whatever the future ends up being. And that's the idea here. Knowing how uncertain things are, even month by month, we want municipalities to be able to build a resilient, sustainable, and equitable transportation future in their CBDs so that they can thrive regardless of what twists and turns COVID recovery takes. So for example, if you look under the transportation category in the second or the third row, we know that there is rising popularity of active transportation. But among the unknowns are what the lasting changes will be in commuter rail ridership employer work from home policies and new residential preferences. That's what the WFH stands for, for by the way, work from home, um, will drive the direction of these uncertainties. And some potential strategies for coping with them could be investments in pedestrian and bicycle facilities and quick build pilot transportation projects to accelerate the implementation of projects that could support public transit. Now, the categories that we've included here, you'll notice, are not just transportation. And that's because we found in our interviews and in our research that it's really difficult to pull apart the different strands of public life. For example, jobs and health trends will both affect public transit ridership. So those things need to be considered and understood in order to um, accurately or uh, effectively address commuter rail ridership, for example, and other, and other transportation trends and uncertainties. And so this framework will allow us to create a guidebook that is as useful, useful as possible for our municipalities, no matter what the future brings and reflects where we are in the pandemic recovery today. And so we'll circle back to the questions that I proposed in the beginning. And they are, in addition to those that have emerged from the interviews, are there other themes that you think we could focus on in the guidebook that are important? Second question is, is the proposed recovery framework, recovery scenario framework useful? And do you feel that it meets the goals of the study? And finally, what other information would be helpful in a recovery guidebook? So you don't have to answer these in order. You can answer one or all of them, um, but they're just they're there to help you to give us some structured feedback. And that's all that I have. And I'm happy to take any questions or, or responses to some of these discussion questions. Thank you, Betsy. Lynn Diggins. Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. I mean, I like where this is headed. Uh, I mean, these questions require some more thought on my part. I mean, I'll be happy to respond to you by email or by phone call. By when would be the latest you would like for us to get back to you? Um, you know, as soon as is feasible, I, our, our funding or the, of course, the study runs funding runs out at the end of September. So certainly prior to that, preferably this month would be was when we're writing the guidebook. So okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. David Cozes. So oh, thank you. Um one thing I think would be helpful in a recovery guidebook, you know, relates to you know, many of the changes that were made during the pandemic relate to removing parking spaces, you know, to add in street dining or to add bike lanes or, you know, just more open space. So I guess the question I have is, you know, for these communities that you talk to, what did they say in terms of how important um, it is to these communities to keep as many parking spaces as they could to help support the local businesses? you know, versus how important it would be to, you know, remove, a, you know, a lot of spaces to support the businesses by providing all these other benefits. The majority of municipalities or interviews that we, that we, we held 
folks, and mo most of them said they did remove parking spaces in some capacity, whether it was a couple in some of the smaller towns or, or, or a lot. Um, most of folks said that they were surprised at how much people didn't mind that, you know, even even people with retail establishments that even putting taking away parking spaces and putting in whether it's a parklet or dining for a particular restaurant there have it's been fairly successful and for example if, if some of them got did did that with funding for the shared streets program in the fall and then that was like put on the shelf for the winter of course because it was cold and then but then they would renew it again in the spring so there has, and some of them are trying to find ways to continue to fund that, right? So that it's been pretty successful and less pushback, I think, than they might have expected in kind of non COVID times. Um, and so, you know, even it, it, people, and I think part of it is people realizing businesses realize and they're seeing that a lot of people are walking instead. Part of that is probably COVID driven, right? Less, less driving and more people actually working from home and able to get out and walk around during the day. Um, so there's kind of, I think that the fact that people were walking more and outside more and able to visit local businesses, replacing perhaps some car trips probably helped mitigate some of those concerns from businesses um, that that taking away parking spaces would reduce their their um, their business. Right, Betsy. So, yeah, I think that this is really interesting information, and I I think it could be really very helpful to just spell out in the guidebook what the community said, how many of these communities are actually planning to keep all these parking spaces removed, you know, permanently um, for other benefits, and and how many communities said. You know what exactly did they say and like how many are they gonna add back or, or are they gonna keep all of their trials you know during the pandemic sort of uh permanent because of the other benefits that it provides to the to the downtown areas absolutely do that thank you that's very helpful any instance thank you mr chair um thank you betsy and i before i make a comment I plan to make just to follow up on what David was um, David Kozis was saying was that um, the town of Arlington we did some surveying of residents regarding uh, their their feelings or their their reactions to some of the changes like the parklets that were done and and very sort of a sort of a business um, and economic development survey that we did so we'd be happy to share that but that basically showed that many people in town or, or the majority of, of people in town that responded to the survey were in favor of, uh, you know, keeping the parklets permanent or continuing them on for a longer period. So I, I don't know if that may be interesting or useful for you, um, but happy to, you know, reach out to me and, and let me know and I think we can get you um, some information about that. So that, you know, goes to David's question or point about um, how that was, you um, how people reacted or, or how, you know, some communities are, are thinking about keeping things permanent. Um, I think my other question or my comment may have been answered already, or, or I was sort of thinking about whether, I think this thread was already sort of included, but um, just the idea of if people are working from home more, are they going to um, the local businesses more often or, or partly that, but partly sort of supporting them and either walking or biking to there as opposed to um, driving perhaps to like another town or another part of the region, you know, to go to um, a location. So I want, I, I just mentioned that or mentioned that as a theme, wondering if that either came up as a thought process or is something that um, in terms of bike and walk improvements if that's sort of part of the consideration is this uh, I don't know reorientation a bit if people are spending more time at home if they're intentionally sort of shopping more locally we asked we did ask that question during our interviews whether people well first of all are people working from home more 
and are they supporting local businesses? I think one of the challenges is that unlike perhaps unlike Arlington, there hasn't there hasn't necessarily been a lot of surveying or kind of quantifying some of these numbers. Um, so a lot of our interviewees who are planners kind of said, you know, from what their observations were, that generally that was the case, um, especially in municipalities where and see their CBDs have a high share of residential workers. And I think I think there's there is a bit of a difference. For example, when we talk with Chelsea, um, they have a high uh, non-work from home population. There's a lot of retail and restaurants and, and folks that really can't work from home or else they have to commute to the city for essential jobs. And so there wasn't for that particular situation, like there was less of that dynamic. Whereas in some of the towns where you are where you do have more of a residential population who are not working essential jobs, quote unquote essential. I mean, we're all essential in a way, <laughs> in our own ways, but um, that, yes, that dynamic I think is more at play. So there is, I think there is a bit of a difference, but generally I would, that that was the sense that I got from, from, from our interviewees. Thank you very much. Oh, and yes, definitely I'll follow up with you about that survey, thank you. Oh yeah, sure. I'm over. Hi, David. It's Bill Conroy. I think you were trying to unmute Tom. So yeah. you want Tom? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll stand <laughs> down. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Bill. You're a gentleman. Sure. Um, just uh, wanted to follow up uh, on, on what David had to say. I, I agree with that. We were we were concerned about the loss of parking spaces, and there were quite a few in Norwood. Um, but the reality is there really was no uh, real pushback after the fact. So um, I think that's important information. And I, I guess my question to Betsy is how will that be presented in the report? Will it, will it be like case studies uh, highlighting that sort of thing? Or how do you plan to present that? Because I think it's important. Yeah, so we're, we, since our, our um, kind of date, our municipal profiles are based, our CBD's information is based largely on interviews, um, at least to get to understand what, what some of the interventions and, um, and how things have kind of um, evolved and, and how, how, what the outcomes have been. So we'll be writing it up as, as kind of a case study, like um, we'll have some background information about demographics about the town and some of the employment statistics and like what are major industries and that sort of thing. But it'll largely be kind of a, a discussion of different themes that we've heard. And this is what different municipalities have said about X, Y, or Z theme, whether it's bicycle improvements or you know, what, whatever it is, um, or parking. And we'll be kind of narrating and be more of a narrative about what different municipalities have told us and what has worked and what hasn't, some challenges that they faced, et cetera. So to answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Now, Bill Conroy. Thank you, David. Um, Betsy, can you put the slide up prior to that, showing the chart? Please. Sure. Okay. So um, this is just my two cents, and it has to do with transportation, has to do about um, you know, recovery from where we're at, uh, people coming back to work specifically as it relates to downtown. Um, we've, we've gone ahead and made some, some changes or some major changes, if you were, to city streets as relate to infrastructure, removing parking, putting out bike lanes and such. That being said, as I've uh, conveyed this to the administration, we have to be careful about what we're doing on certain streets, meaning that any streets that directly our off ramps and on ramps onto the major regional system. As we know right now, I-93 northbound and southbound are jammed almost, I'd say 20 out of 24 hours a day, okay? We know that. And right now, as we sit here in City Hall, um, exit 23, which North Street exit, um, that exit right now is virtually empty during the day. That being said, that's because downtown proper financial district, people aren't back to work yet. That being said, I'm hearing rumblings, they may come back in September, October, could be Christmas. Um, that being said, all that transportation, those main streets like North Street, State Street, Cambridge Street, 
they were all part of a staff south and staff north that was done during the central artery. So when we took out the elevated artery and built the central artery, uh, uh, analysis report through tram plan was done. And these arterial streets greatly have impact onto the major highway system. That being Atlantic Avenue, uh, Lincoln Street. So anything where we're reducing the capacity of the roadways on these major arterials could have a devastating impact onto the regional system. And I even look out to the west there where we know in Newton, we have a serious impact as we exist today with the exit 17. So um, I'm just, we have, you know, I know everybody wanted to be proactive and say, well, let's get things in place now and people grow accustomed to those things. But as major traffic comes back within the city of Boston, we're really gonna have to rethink those things. I, I have to err on the side of caution when we are being so progressive in certain areas like this, uh, because I think we're going to be in a, in, a, in a conundrum here when it relates to traffic. And we know where that all goes. When the main line backs up, the first calls always go back up to the state house. They always go to the governor and then they flow all the way down to every other municipality. So um, I just, I have to say that, and I've, I've, you know, you can hear it in my voice, air on the side of caution here. Everybody wants to be progressive and I understand that, but there's certain towns and communities that can get away with this. But as we're dealing with the major uh, city like city of Boston, the certain areas of Boston can get away with it, the certain areas that we have to really rethink. So um, that's my two spends. Uh, you know, I commend you Betsy and other people of what we're doing. And then uh, just to end it with the one comment with replacing parking, if we take parking off, which we did to city streets, that was a major revenue for our capital, okay, with the parking revenue. We've lost a lot of retail, we've lost a lot of curbside parking. As it relates, now we're giving that park, that space up to outdoor cafes and others. So we as a municipality need to look at that and see what we're going to charge for that space. We cannot continue going down the road of giving away free space to businesses on street because eventually, as we all know, we work under a tax revenue to get money back. So we need to sustain a healthy environment for all. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Tom Ben. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Betsy, uh, uh, thank you for this. Um, I, I just had a couple of questions on, um, well, when you were talking to the uh, municipalities, did, did you talk to them? Was there much discussion about what the impact of the loss of dry, uh, parking spaces would be on the elderly population who would be less apt to uh, be, you know, walking to these destinations? Uh, you know, and some of those are city of squares. And, you know, a lot of that retail is, you know, is in the squares. So, um, you know, with the uh, pockets that were put in, which have been very successful, um, I'm just wondering if you, you've talked to the cities or any council on aging to see what kind of impact was there. Then the other question I had is, is there any talk about uh, from the different municipalities of standardization of these parklets? Because you ride through now, like some of us a great example, you have a little bit of everything. And uh, one of the concerns that I've seen and I've heard out there is safety for the, the uh, patrons of these park, you know, parklets. Uh, I know we had an incident where a car did you know, uh, drive into one, luckily nobody was hurt. So I, I didn't know if you know, that was another thought. And then uh, what Bill just happened to say about you know, uh, the loss of revenue is, is obviously uh, a, a concern. So I didn't know if that had come up in any of your discussions. Thanks. That's, those are all your questions. Um, the short answer, okay, so we haven't, we talked about um, loss of parking with, with planner or, or with our interviewees. None of them brought up um, the impacts on elderly, but I think that could be something that we can kind of look more into. Um, we are holding a, a community focus group next week. So that's something we can, we can post to them, I think, um, to talk about. So that's really good to, good to know. Um, they have not brought, brought up loss of parking revenue either. 
Um, so I'm glad you guys, you, both you and Bill brought that up. It's something we can certainly include a discussion of. Um, I will say that some of them, parking was already free or they, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a concern initially, right? Cause they, cause they didn't charge for parking. Um, I think that was all your questions. Oh, standardization of park lists. Yep. Um, yeah, a lot of them, I think there's a lot of interest, there seems to be some interest in kind of, there isn't a standardization and some, uh, you know, some municipalities would really like to have things like concrete bears, like that's something that not everyone's been able to afford. And so um, I think there's a lot of variation. There's a lot, there is interest of like having more funding available or getting funding to be able to create a safe space so that you're not just putting people onto the road and like just putting like, you know, I don't know, strings up or something, right? Um, so I think that's something to, that, that will have to be, that folks will have to kind of figure out as, as they move forward with, with, with that designing these. Great. Thank you. Lynn Dickens. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this conversation going on for a while and a little, in a very interesting way. I've had a little time to think. And, and, and Betsy, I know if we were talking on the phone, you might say to me, Len, this is not a good idea, not the appropriate place <laughs> for it. But I'm thinking um, for a category, maybe um, um, sus uh, sustainability with respect, from, respect to climate. And um, I know it's not particularly, not per se a recovery thing, but it is I mean, something that is really top of mind. And, and it's very important. And, and it is a reason for perhaps why we can't continue doing things the way that we've been doing them. But once again, that may not apply in this study. And if so, I accept that. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, Betsy, can you put your next slide up one last time? The questions for discussion. Oops. Yep. So again, Betsy would very much like for the MPO to get her some some discussion around these issues. I think we've had some discussion around a couple of them. There hasn't been a lot of discussion around some others. So um, if people are have ideas or concepts, please get them to Betsy. Um, like I don't think there was any discussion on the second question. So. If, if you think this this scenario is of value, you should you should let Betsy know. If you think there's different ways to make the scenario of value, you should let Betsy know. If you think the, the scenario doesn't really add to the study, which I'll just say is my own personal opinion, you should let Betsy know, okay? So, so there, was, there was a lot of good discussion, but it wasn't necessarily focused on the questions and please do try to try to get more discussion around the questions to Betsy in whatever way you can you can get Betsy her answers. Betsy, would you like to say anything else before we go to the next agenda item? Uh, no, just thank you all for your feedback. Um, I think most importantly, I would like in feedback on the scenario framework because it is a bit of a shift from what, it, it, it's a rethinking of what the initial uh, concept was in the scope simply because we're in recovery now and we're not, you know, we don't necessarily need, you know, specific recovery scenarios. Um, but if it isn't something that you feel is important or there could be other ways to think about it or, or write about it, I'm very, definitely open to suggestions. So if there's one, one question to focus on, that would be it. Right, okay, so so I will just say that, again, since I mentioned it, I, I, I have a, I, I have a, the difficulty understanding how the scenario framework would be used to make the report to, to, to add value to the report, right? I, 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 I have no objection to the scenarios as defined, right? They, they make sense to me. I just don't understand what's the point of them. Like, like what, like, given that there there are so many unknowns, like, like what will that do? How, how will that influence what this what this report actually is? I guess I, I just didn't understand the connection. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, so what we're trying to do is to help municipalities, you know, identify what has worked and what could work going forward if certain things change in certain different factors change in different ways. 
into the future. For example, if I'm picking a commuter rail ridership, but um, say it, it decreases a lot, right? Because people are working from home more, they're deciding they want to live somewhere else, so they're going to commuter rail. Um, how do how do we then, depending on the direction of that of that ridership, what could municipalities kind of invest in, or, or what policies could they propose, kind of change, or or even the MPO thinking about if that occurs, where should we be putting our money, or where should a municipality put in our money if if we're losing commuter rail ridership? And so it's kind of a it's kind of a scenario planning and long range planning exercise in sense of like. We know like this is where we are now, but there are all these unknowns. And so instead of saying prescribing, this is you know, these three scenarios that we think will happen, acknowledging that we don't know what's going to happen, but what but these are the things that we think are important to keep an eye on. And if they go in a certain direction, then we want to be thinking about making X, Y, or Z investments, right? So the case studies are really about, this is what municipalities have done and things that folks can think about um, based on their peer, you know, peer municipalities. And I think the recovery scenarios are really about, okay, then how do we think about what to go, do going forward? So maybe if that is a framework that makes sense to you, maybe that's something that we can make clear in the guidebook. Yeah, I guess I just, so. I don't want to monopolize this part of the conversation, but I guess I just, so can you put, again, put the framework back up, I guess now this time. <clears throat> so let's just stay on lasting changes to commuter rail ridership. I'm not clear what, like what will the guidebook say about that? I mean, the guidebook will say, presumably based on what you just said, we don't know yet what the long-term implication on commuter rail ridership is of the recovery. Is the guidebook then going to say, but if it continues to, to lag communities that are located in, in commuter rail, with commuter rail stations and their CBD should be considering this. And those of you who don't have commuter rail should be considered. Like, I, I just don't understand like how you can make the, the scenarios by definition have to be pretty broad. And they are sort of a lot of, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot more driving forces than just the ones on this, on this chart, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I just, I just, I, I, this isn't a criticism of the chart or even of, of the idea. It's just, I just don't know the connection between the guidebook and the case studies and these scenarios because there are so many unknowns and there are so many driving forces like employer work from home policies, right? Theoretically, there's a lot of people who think employer work from home policies may result in a long-term movement out of the inner core to, to, to more, right? If you only have to get into your, to your job in the inner core once a day or once a week or twice a week, you may move farther away from the inner core. That may or may not be true, but that's a driving force and an unknown. And I, I, I just, there are so many that I don't know how this scenario framework as well done as it is, benefits the study, I guess is my question. And, I, and I'm perfectly okay if the answer is, I just don't understand it. I just, I, I, I have a hard time drawing the connection between this work and the other work. You did it between this work and the case studies? Yes, yes. This okay. work and the other valuable work you're doing, the surveys and the case studies and yeah. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, and I, it's, I think part of it is really that we, that there are a lot of unknowns and it's really a discussion of what people should be thinking about. We don't wanna, we're not prescribing that if, if commuter rail goes up, this is the sort of investment you should make. That's not really our, our role, right? So it's more of a, these are things to think about, to consider if we're facing um, you know, X, Y, or Z changes in the transportation system or in out, transportation outcomes or ridership or the like. Um, and the case studies are really there to kind of ground it in, this is what's happening. This is the things we're seeing in our communities. So let's think about those. And then there are you know, things that have been raised about, um, you know, about shifting in com community peaks. Like folks are seeing that in their municipalities. And so we wanna document that, put that into our unknowns, right? And there's questions about, you know, uh, they're seeing different, so we're kind of pulling, trying to pull some of the themes that we're seeing in the case studies and some of the questions that are arising in the case studies 
into this narrow framework. Right, so, so the, 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 the case studies really ground it and we can kind of then pull some of those issues that are arising and put them as narrow framework and create this bigger picture of, of, okay, what do we do going forward given the sort of unknowns and things that the people are talking about um, on the ground and also in research that we're, that we're reading. Does that, does that help? I will hopefully have generated some discussion. Ken Miller. <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. Um, I, 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 I'm sort of uh, leaning. Uh, so I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand this myself. And I, I, have a, I have a different question that relates to the transportation interventions. I mean, how are those different from any other trans things you would do? These are good things to do at any time. How are these transportation interventions particularly related to uh, some kind of recovery? Uh, uh, um, 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 that, that's sort of my question. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot more. I guess, why, why wouldn't you do these things anyway? Well, some, some, some of them have, people have only done in the context of the pandemic, such as, you know, parklets are not, and, and taking over, um, you know, putting in more public space. That's, that's a bit new, newer. It's partly because some of the, the changes in terms of regulations uh, around outdoor dining have been loosened in the context of the pandemic. And there's also been more funding available such as through from the shared streets programs. So some of them are things that yes, we probably would be great to have been done before, but we the, the kind of, there are things that have taken place in the past year and a half that have allowed these things to be more commonplace. Um, you know, and same with this, and, and, so it, but, but we will, you know, people can, you know, also help people think about like, these are, you can kind of accelerate or increase some of the in, in, interventions that you may have been doing before, but maybe there's more demand for biking and walking. So we want to build more, have a bigger emphasis on building bike lanes. Well, but also conversely, it's possible, given some of the things that like Tom Bent talked about or, or Bill Conroy, that there are interventions and again, possible, not, not definitely, but there are interventions that possibly are related to the, the changed environment under COVID, that if, if the post-COVID environment is different and people are going back to, to eating indoors primarily and, and, and congestion has increased, there may be some interventions that were by definition important during COVID, but are less important and possibly counter to the new emerging travel patterns, whatever they are, that will need to be rethought, right? I mean, th there is that possibility too, right? Post-COVID may be different, but it may not be different like we have today where people were willing to give up parking spaces because frankly, nobody was dining inside and, and nobody needed those parking spaces and they needed the outside space for, for people to dine outside because they were comfortable to dine outside, right? So th th there is that possible future too in your scenario, right, I think. Yes, absolutely. I mean, all these things are, are unknown. And, and I think the challenge is kind of creating some sort of scenario framework or, or scenarios that are useful. You know, now that we, when we wrote the, 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 the scope, we didn't have vaccines, they weren't approved, right? And so we're kind of navigating, how, how do we make this useful uh, you know, give information for people to think about, we, regardless, even if we do kind of some of the changes aren't, aren't long term. And so this, this feedback is, is helpful. Thank you, Brian Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the recognition. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about commuter rail ridership um, and sort of the criticality of it to the future and, and sort of try to um, get into the, the consideration. So basically, as I see this, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of asking Betsy to put on her crystal ball or to get out of her crystal ball and predict the future. Obviously, nobody can do that. Um, but I think this is useful in the sense that it is beginning to do the underpinnings of that research. Obviously, none of us know where we're gonna be six, eight, 10, 12 months from now. Um, but I do think that this sort of a study is important to begin the process of trying to figure that out. Um, specifically with respect to commuter rail, 
one thing that, that 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 we've been trying to sound the alarm on for for a while now, well, for the last several months anyway, is the fact that the T is looking at a massive deficit starting in 2024, uh, several hundred million dollars a year, unless commuter rail ridership returns, uh, and, and with that, fare paying commuter rail ridership returns. Uh, there's all this talk of free fares, which are great, um, but they're not going to pay the T's bills. Um, so, you know, when the federal money dries up in, in, on July 1 of 2024, um, they're looking at a 300 to $450 million operating deficit, which will, uh, you know, necessitate massive, massive bad things happening. Um, so I think that a study like this can be helpful in a couple of ways around that issue. One is um, certainly highlighting it, which we certainly hope it will do, but also um, part of the deficit is, is a lack of fare. It will come from a lack of fare paying commuter rail riders, but also from a lack of commuter rail parkers. So something around utilizing the municipal space in the middle of a lot of CBDs that are MBTA parking lots is something that this study could begin to spur conversations and planning and efforts on. And to Ken's point, yeah, it's sort of what the planning is anyway, but since we are in a new paradigm, I think we all agree with that, this study is an opportunity to sort of move things in that direction. So if parklets, for instance, are a problem on municipal rights of way, um, maybe the MBTA commuter rail parking lots in a lot of CBDs would become a nice place to put those, theoretically. Uh, the T needs some money out of it, obviously, but I'm just saying I think there are opportunities that the study will present that we, we can't even fathom at the moment um, that will begin the, will help spur the process that we're all sort of trying to figure out what comes next. Um, so I, I think this is certainly worth doing. I, I get that it's not, um, it, 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 it's not perfect because it's, it's future casting. It, it, by definition, it can't be perfect. Um, but I think it, 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 it's worth doing. It's a valuable use of, of, of resources. And uh, I certainly uh, would, would encourage everyone to support it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Betsy, will, is the scenario framework going to get into the level of detail that Brian just got into? So I guess that that's another question I now have, right? So so Brian has talked about that the the changes in in commuter rail ridership may may ultimately result in significant changes to the MBTA. They may may result in the, in the not the, the no longer needing all the parking we have and surplusing that parking. Is is that the level of of detail that that, that the framework will drive in the study? I think we want to capture as, as many unknowns as possible that are that are relevant. Um, I don't think we want to go into detail on every single every single factor um, that could affect the future, but certainly you know related to commuter rail ridership, that's that's a big one. And um, but you know we'll we'll try to capture as, as many as as are are relevant and 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 interest and and yeah relevant to the MPO. Thanks, Betsy. So again. I think we've generated a little bit more discussion now. So Betsy got a little more discussion. And if you have other issues or ideas or concerns, please do email Betsy and let her know. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, everyone. Next item on the agenda is the NPO election survey results. Rosine Foley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and good morning, board members and members of the public. Uh, my name is Roisin Foley, and I'm the Administrative and Communications Associate on the Certification Activities and MPO Support Team at MPO Staff. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'll be presenting the results of a survey that we conducted between January and May of 2021. The goal of this survey was to gauge familiarity with and opinions about the MPO municipal elections process. Um, we were looking for those opinions among the 97 cities and towns in the MPO region because those are the munis who are eligible to stand for election to the board and to vote in the annual elections. Um, the results of the survey, including responses to open answer questions are posted to the meeting calendar. 
Um, to prepare the data for posting, we did remove a small number of open answer responses, um, either for irrelevance or identifying information. We also paraphrased some of the open answer responses for clarity um, and worked to include answers that actually did fit into multiple choice categories into those categories so that we could present them in figures and charts. Um, I'd like to thank Hane Kim for all of her hard work cleaning and formatting the data. It was super helpful. Um, so today I'll be going over why we did the survey, how we went about survey design, our communications and outreach process, um, some key results and themes, um, and then I'll send it over to the vice chair to open it up for questions and discussion. Next slide, please. So why did we do this survey? Um, as you know, every four years, the Federal Highway and Transit Administration's review the MPO's activities and issue a certification report that includes both commendations and recommendations for improvement. Um, the last report was published in 2019 and in it, the MPO's federal partners recommended that the MPO should review voting procedures for MPO board seats to ensure that they effectively engage all communities in the region and result in effective representation. Next slide, please. So before getting into the survey design, it's helpful to review um, what the current election procedures actually are um, as laid out in the MPO's memorandum of understanding. So currently uh, MAPC and uh, the MBT advisory board jointly administer the elections with logistical support from MPO staff. The MPO has 12 elected municipal members, four seats are at large, two for towns and two for cities. And then there are eight seats that represent each of the eight MAPC subregions, and these can be held by cities or towns. Terms are for three years, and each fall, four of the 12 seats are up for election. Chief elected officials of the munis in the region vote in the elections, um, and generally speaking, historically, about half of the CEOs in the region regularly vote. Um, and these elections are usually held at MAPC's fall council meeting. Um, this past year, we did do it um, online um, during the pandemic. Um, in the last 21 years, 17% of the 97 eligible municipalities in the MPO region have held seats on the board. Seven municipalities have run but have never been elected. So that's the current process that we're working with and that our federal partners recommended we take a look at. Um, next slide, please. So our key questions for this process were guided by the federal recommendation. Um, are we engaging all the communities in the region? And does that engagement result in effective representation? Um, and on the slide here is a graphic that we use to advertise the survey. Next slide, please. So as the entities that oversee the elections process, um, MPO Vice Chair MAPC represented by Eric Barasa and permanent board member MBTA Advisory Board represented by Brian Kane, presented an initial proposal for a survey of MPO member municipalities at a meeting in May of 2020. Um, the MPO discussed the initial proposal as well as the elections process in general um, and directed Eric and Brian to work with us at MPO staff on revising the survey and issuing it. Um, given the demands of the pandemic on municipal capacity, we decided to wait to launch until early this year. Um, communications about the survey were sent out via the MPO, MAPC, and MBTA advisory board mailing lists. Um, and during the course of the survey period, we did also do some targeted outreach to known contacts um, in member municipalities that we knew had not yet participated. Next slide, please. So moving into the main event results, um, it's likely that the increased demands of the pandemic on municipal staff was still a factor in response rate, but we were able to get 90 responses from 55 municipalities or 56% of the municipalities in the region. Um, one additional response came from a municipality outside the region, Stoughton. Um, we decided not to discard this because Stoughton was previously in our region and has since left. So we felt that their perspective could actually be useful. Um, so their response is in the data, but it's not on the map here. Um, so most municipalities responded once, but we received multiple responses from some, um, which are indicated by the increasingly darker shading on this map. Um, in particular, you'll note that we received 11 responses from Situate alone, which is definitely something to keep in mind when reading through the results. Um, and we did receive at least one response from all um, eight MAPC subregions. 
Next slide, please. So the chart here shows the distribution of responses um, by the position of the responder in their muni. The highest number of responses in the aggregate came from those who identified themselves as either planning or DPW staff. Um, some of the open response answers later in the survey indicate that this may be a key disconnect for the elections process. Our primary contacts um, at the MPO are with planning and DPW staff, but chief elected officials are the folks who vote and run for MPO board seats. So internal communication within municipalities might not be in a place where all parties are necessarily on the same page about relationships to the MPO process. And that is definitely something that we could work to bridge. Next slide, please. Um, it makes sense then um, that the main ways respondents reported interacting with the MPO were TIP related. Um, either submitting projects for consideration or having projects currently programmed. Um, the folks within planning and DPW departments who know the MPO and are intimately involved in project design are not the same folks necessarily responsible for participating in the elections process. Um, so 89% of respondents had heard of the MPO, um, but 32% and 16% were either somewhat familiar or not at all familiar. Um, next slide, please. You can see this lack of familiarity with the elections process itself um, in the numbers on this slide, uh, with 42% not at all familiar with the process of running, 38% not at all familiar with the process of voting, 51% not voting in the past five years or not sure if their community had voted, um, and 70% not running for a seat or not sure if their community had run. Um, Respondents were also split on whether they actually understood the role of elected municipal members, um, with 57% saying they did and 43% saying they either didn't or didn't know if they did. Um, and they were similarly split on whether the MPO understands their local or regional transportation concerns, um, with 55% saying that the MPO either doesn't understand their local concerns or they don't know if it does. Um, open answer responses indicated that some respondents felt the MPO in particular does not understand the concerns of smaller outlying communities. Next slide, please. So if you've been able to look at the survey results, you'll see that many of the questions appear to get at similar ideas in slightly different ways. We wanted to really see how familiar folks are with us, how engaged they are, if they are familiar, and what effective representation actually means to them. Are they not engaged because they don't want to be, or are they not engaged because they don't know what the MPO is and does? Um, and at least for survey respondents, it seems skewed towards the latter interpretation. Um, when asked why their municipalities do not vote, the top responses indicated that a lack of information was key. Um, next slide, please. Um, at the same time, some respondents did indicate that they felt the current board members do a good job representing their interests. Um, when asked why their municipalities do not run for the board, the top responses were a lack of staff capacity and information, but also that current municipal board members do a good job. Um, next slide, please. So as I discussed earlier, a lack of information and knowledge about the MPO seemed to be a general theme throughout the responses, um, with 18% of respondents indicating they do not receive information about MPO elections. Um, those that did receive information generally received it directly from our communications channels. Um, and as I said before, open answer responses indicated a general lack of knowledge um, about the MPO and an appearance of a lack of outreach. Next slide, please. So along these lines, respondents overall seemed unwilling to indicate um, if they felt the process was unfair or not transparent in general, um, with a majority, 54%, uh, saying that they didn't know. Um, this aligns with a lack of familiarity with the process overall. Next slide, please. So in terms of possible solutions um, or changes, we asked both what respondents felt the biggest challenges to running are and what the best solutions might be. Um, interestingly, by far the biggest challenge in the aggregate um, was overall time commitment with 66% overall saying either that serving on the MPO board and or traveling into Boston for board meetings at the state transportation building is time consuming. 
um, taken with open answer responses regarding the improved inclusivity of virtual meetings. Um, it might be a good idea for the MPO to consider its long-term virtual meeting policy as part of the overall attractiveness of running for the MPO, as well as for making meetings more accessible and equitable for the public. Um, open answer responses to the question, what would it take to encourage more municipalities to seek election, also clustered around more information, communication, and outreach. Next slide, please. So in terms of possible changes, um, responses reinforce concerns about the challenges of traveling um, into Boston, um, with 54% overall saying that continuing virtual meetings after the pandemic would increase participation. 58% um, indicated a preference for having only municipalities within subregions vote for their subregional reps, 41% um, for term limits, and 29% for only cities and towns voting for at-large cities and towns. And just to note for this question, people could pick as many options as they wanted. They didn't have to choose. Um, next slide, please. So having run through the results overall, um, here are some key thematic takeaways. Um, among respondents, there was a general lack of knowledge or awareness of the MPO and its role, and a desire for more communication and outreach on the benefits of engaging with the MPO via the elections process. Time commitments um, were viewed as a large barrier to participation, and there was a desire to continue virtual meetings to increase access. Open answer responses indicated that some smaller communities may view the MPO as unaware of their specific transportation concerns and may not see the benefit of seeking election. Um, it is important to remember that elections are not the only way that municipalities can and do engage with us. Um, the results of this survey are also instructive for helping us and staff understand what we can do better with the resources we have available to engage municipalities in other ways. Um, next slide, please. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions folks may have. There are a few discussion questions um, to help Eric guide the discussion. Um, and with that, I'll send it over to Eric. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rasheen. And, and I do want to just say um, thank you um, to Rasheen and the other staff for um, really doing an incredible job putting this all uh, together and doing this analysis. There were a lot of questions and a lot of responses and, and data. Um, fabulous, you know, presentation here. I would like to just say that I think, you know, for me, one of the key lessons is um, in terms of the actual outreach for the MPO elections, just what Rasheen said is we traditionally send the materials to the town manager administrator and the, the, the or the mayor's office or the board of select, the select board. And I think we really need to focus in addition to that on the planning DPW um, and other town staff as well, just to hit as much, many people as, as possible and, and make those connections. Um, and also very interested in having a discussion with staff about how we can kind of promote overall what the MPO does uh, across all of the municipalities and subregions so that people are more aware of kind of what we're doing and, and, and just aware uh, to, if the, to be involved and, and if, if they wanna run. Um, but would love to get general, you know, some general questions. And then also, um, you know, the, the number two here is really about these sort of structural changes. Uh, and these were some of the things that Federal Highway and Federal Transit had also raised in the certification review. So, um, David, do you want to call on folks and, and I'll just... Yep. And, then, and you'll be sitting by to help answer questions and respond. David Kozis. Thank you, David. Um, so like Roshin said, this survey came out of the recertification process. And if I remember, this was also mentioned many times in different recertification processes over the years. So now, you know, now we did this survey and it seems from the results that there's not many concerns really expressed by anybody about the election process itself. You know, it seems okay how it is. I don't really see a loud outcry to change, you know, to change anything. I, I agree with that. Mostly it seemed to be comments about the time that was involved or just general familiarity, right, with the MPO. I think that the most important thing that came out of this was um, 
just whether or not to continue these virtual meetings to make it easier for communities to be able to participate and to run and to know that they could, you know, won't have to come into Boston every two weeks. So that is something that I'm sure we'll be discussing sometime uh, in the next, in the coming up months. So I guess my, so, you know, now at this point, do we report something back to the feds and, you know, do we have a sense that they'll find this satisfactory? Well, so Ken Miller is actually the next person to speak. So Ken, why don't you speak first and then I'll, I'll jump in or Eric can jump in. Ken? Thank you, David. And, and, and yes, thank you. Thank you to staff for doing this. Uh, a couple of comments. First, I think it would be, you got 90 responses of which uh, uh, about 20 or so by my count are from MPO members. Uh, is that is that a sort of a correct es estimate when you add up uh, the, the number of responses is by member communities? Roisin, is that right? About 20 or 21 responses are from MPO members. I'd have to actually go in and do that calculation, but I, I trust your mental math, Ken. Thank you. So if you look at something like table six, for example, but anyway, that, that, that's my, my way of saying, I think it would be very helpful to stratify the results by whether, uh, by whether you're an MPO member representing an MPO community or not. And I think it would also be helpful to do the same thing for the commons, to denote whether the common is from an MPO member community or from a non-MPO member community. Because I'm not sure I would reach the same conclusion that, that David did. So for example, if you look for ta at table six, where it says, uh, are you familiar, how familiar are you with running for the elected official uh, very familiar, some with 25 responses. Well, if 20 people are on the MPO responded uh, out of those 25 are MPO members, that means that only five out of the 90, uh, uh, that means that those percentages would be very different if you did not include the MPO members. Uh, so I think it will be helpful to see this before any conclusions are drawn. To, to stratify by, uh, both the results and the comments by whether you're an MPO member or not. Uh, so I, I, would, I would caution anybody on drawing conclusions until, until we see those, those uh, responses. Uh, just a couple of comments on um, a couple, of, I just have a couple of questions about a couple. Uh, uh, so for, uh, if you add, if you look at the, the uh, question number, uh, I guess the, um, I'm sorry, I lost it. Oh, okay, uh, table 18, which is, uh, I guess, question 21. Um, what would be, you know, some suggestions, I guess? Um, so it says, so if you added together sub-regional representatives elected by municipals and municipalities in this sub-region, uh, and then at large, so the, I think it was the fifth one down, at large city, it wasn't clear the way, but I think you explained it. So it will be, that may, means that at large city will be elected by cities and at large towns will be elected by towns. So that's, okay, so, so if you look at those two things together, uh, those are pretty high percentages to sort of have representative representative government. Uh, but again, I would like to see it again. It's hard to reach conclusions. I think it would be helpful to have this discussion after we see the stratified results. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I'll answer some of the questions that we listed here and then um, toss out a couple uh, thoughts in, uh, and uh, in terms of only sub-regions voting for sub-region representatives, I think that's a good idea. And uh, I think it might actually spur some more um, activity or force us or encourage us to um, get more activity within um, each of the sub-regions. Um, cities um, voting for at-large cities, I, I'm, I'm no on that. Uh, I think 
I'm not too big into making a distinction between um, towns and cities, but but that's just an opinion. I'm not going to back it up with anything. Um, term limits. I guess I have a question here. If I recall, you said that the seven municipalities I mean had run but not been elected. That's correct. Yeah, and and so. Um, and so that makes me a little bit concerned because it may be that they're just getting locked out. I'm generally not a fan of term limits. I mean, uh, I mean, generally my solution is like, maybe we can find a way for more people to serve me. But if we have competent uh, people who want to uh, be a, a part of the MPO board and they can't, you know, then I think that's a little problematic. Uh, so that's my th answers to these questions. I mean, um, some thoughts I want to toss out in terms of getting um, word out about uh, the MPO. I think we might try to bring the advisory board, the MPTA, the MBTA advisory board, um, in on the process. I know that Mr. Kane uh, has mentioned you know, the advisory board, or at least members from the advisory board uh, approaching their um, town officials, especially the elected, I mean, and and letting them know what's going on with the advisory board. I think we could do more than one thing in in that kind of meeting. Uh, second is that uh, in talking to um, in thinking about bringing the planning staff or reaching out to the planning staff, I think we can also make it clear, uh, have the planning staff make it clear to the folks that do the voting that you don't have to serve me on the MPO board, just like Mr. Amstutz means representing you know, the chair of the Arlington Select Board. I think if they are aware that they won't feel so much that it is a big um, time commitment, but it is actually a big time commitment. And uh, one of the suggestions I think I saw in here was that we might want to split off I mean, some of the uh, activity in one of these meetings to a shorter meeting outside of business hours. And I think something like the report that we're going to review later on on Milton would be a good candidate for that. You know? and, and so, because I feel that uh, in these meetings, such good work doesn't get the broad, um, the wide um, publicity that it should, that's not quite the right word, but it's just more people should know about it. It's for especially people out in those areas. And I think it might take care of something else that we heard. And that is that any of the MPO should maybe get around more. I know that's more in a non-virtual world, but still we could have these reports being advertised in the areas where they are, where they affect I me, mean, what, they're, what they're all reporting on and try and get some activity or some interest from those areas um, generated. Uh, and, um, Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes over here. Um, yeah, uh, and the last thing, and this is, um, I'm not quite sure where the right place is for this, and I've been meaning to talk to the uh, executive director about this, but you, one of the issues I often hear me about is we just don't have enough I mean, racial diversity, and I often say there's just not enough racial diversity to go around. But when it comes to gender, that's not the case. I mean, and I think we really need to try to find some way, you know, to increase you know, um, gender um, balance, I mean, on this board, I mean, and maybe in the process of trying to solve for that, we can maybe even I mean, get some more, I mean, ethnic diversity uh, on. And, and so I don't know if it's really an election thing, I mean, but, but when we do outreach, I mean, let's try to um, see if we can make it such that people are aware that this is a uh, good place for, for both genders and even point out the fact you know, of the strong leadership I mean, that we have I mean, on the board I mean, by women and the great work that is done. And I think you know, we might even get like not only better um, results because we have studies that show that, that boards I mean, and groups that have better gender diversity and uh, more gender diversity or equity I mean, behave, function better, um, but we might find that it's easier to get more people involved and, and wanting to run. Sorry for all of that, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Other questions from MPO members before I call on non-MPO members? Seeing none, Steve Olinoff. Uh, so first I have, I have three things. First, I have a question. Some of the people answered the question with just the word Massachusetts. What was all, that all about? What were they trying to say? Yeah, so that was a glitch in downloading the responses from SurveyMonkey. Some people put Massachusetts after the name of their municipality, and it ended up in a different um, 
form and it should have been cleaned before we posted. Sorry about that. Okay, thanks. I was wondering about that. Uh, so, so a number of people saying, well, you know, everyone's, everything seems to be okay. Everyone's happy with the way things are, but I'm not sure that's really the case. I think you might want to look at it from another direction, which is that we agree that there are definitely some improvements needed, but no one can figure out exactly how to improve it. So we're kind of uh, saying, you know, what do we do here? Uh, I, th I think there are some improvements needed uh, to get more interested in, 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 the, in these elections. And uh, we really need to think harder about it. Now, for example, uh, the first bullet there, only subregions uh, will vote for subregional representatives as a suggestion. That's effectively what's happening right now. Uh, when a seat in a, su a subregion, they decided that the person or the town decides not to run for re-election, what happens is when the subregion gets together at the regular subregional meetings, uh, they talk over and say, okay, who's gonna run? And they come up with someone uh, who's going to run. And consequently, uh, they that's the effectively the election right there. And, and there's no uh, opposition from anyone else. Very, really, I'm not sure if ever, uh, there have been two candidates running in a, in a similar subregion against each other. So, uh, that's not a fix for anything, uh, and I don't know what can be done about that. Uh, and, and the thing I mentioned early on when we originally started this whole process is we have three-year terms and two uh, at-large from cities and towns, which, which means the way it's now, uh, you have one and one, one year, one and one, next year, and the next year, no one. So it means every third year, Usually, with, given that the subregions don't have any competition, uh, and now you have no at-large elections, that third year, every third year, you're going to have a completely uncontested election process, which is, if you look back, that's been the case. So those are my comments and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Brian King. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just wanted to uh, echo the, the the thanks to um, everyone at CTPS for all the hard work on this. Uh, Eric really uh, led this. Um, the uh, you know, so I try to get municipal CEOs engaged on T issues. That's my job, and it's really hard. Um, I sent 176 letters out. Um, last month, and I think I got like 30 responses from people asking, are you the CEO of your municipality? Um, the fact is, Massachusetts is not set up for regionalism. It's, it's set up for 351 individual fiefdoms. And that's the system we have. We don't do regionalism. As much as I try, and, and Eric's organization tries, and CTPS tries, and we all try, um, people do not get elected in their city or town to be regionalists. They get elected to run their little town or city, not little. They, they get to run they, for issues that are within the box of their borders. So with all that said, I, I do think we're doing a pretty good job with what we have to work with. There are no ideal solutions here. Um, there, there's, no, there's no magic bullet that will fix all of the people's concerns. Um, serving on this board takes time and takes effort that not all municipalities are staffed to do. Um, certainly not all municipal CEOs are resourced or able to do. Um, we survive but really based on volunteerism. Um, my organization certainly survives based on volunteerism, having several members that have the time and, and the will to do the work. And I think that's also true here. So, um, you know, I would suggest that, you know, this is great that we're reaching out and trying to get information, but the fact of the matter is, um, the fact that we get participation at all is, is, is really a miracle in some ways. Um, so I, I think we're doing, we're doing really well. It's not perfect. Um, but we shouldn't let the perfect get in the way of the good. 
Um, it's never going to be good enough. And we always have to keep trying to be better. I wholeheartedly agree with Len's uh, statements on diversification. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm working on that personally in my organization, transitioning uh, this seat to, to somebody else who will, um, who is uh, a young woman of color, who uh, I think will add a really important voice. Um, but, you know, that takes time and, and all of this stuff takes time. So uh, all that is, is just to say that, you know, I think we are doing pretty well with what we have, uh, you know, with the system we have to work within. Um, I'm glad we're doing this. We should survey our membership and our and our audience and our constituents more. Um, and you know, and again, I just wanted to thank Eric and and everyone, uh, Kate and Roisin and everyone CTPS for all the hard work they did. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Others. So, um, consistent with Ken Miller's request, since Federal Highway asked us to to take this on to begin with. Um, Regine, you need to go back and, and, and cut your data a different way. Because I, I, I take Brian's points to heart, as I always do. Um, if, if the non-NPO respondents think there's a problem in that the, the, there's no point in running because they won't get elected then we have possibly an issue. If they don't think there's a problem, the fact that there's no turnover just means everybody thinks everybody who's on this board is doing a good job, right? I, I think most people on this board do a great job, so I can understand why that would be the case. But if, if the survey shows that, that there, there is a desire for people to serve, but they don't, they don't run or they don't get elected because of a flaw in our system, then that's where we have to figure out how to address that flaw if indeed it exists. And again, I have no idea if it exists, but but I think the whole point of, and Ken, jump in here if I'm wrong. I think the whole point of FHWA's comments on the certification review were, there doesn't seem to be any turnover. And is that a, a systemic issue or is that there's no turnover because everybody likes what's going on? And I think that's what we need to try to get at as the answer, because if the answer is, people want to serve, but they feel shut out. You know, term limits is, an, is, an, is one answer, but it's not the only answer, right? There, there are, just to Steve Olinoff's point, we could talk about expanding the membership of the NPO by adding a city and town. I don't know that that makes sense. I don't know if anybody else thinks that makes sense, but there are other answers we, we could take on if indeed we think there's a problem. But first we have to figure out is, is there a problem? And not only do we think there's a problem, but do the communities we represent think there's a problem? Any other comments on this before we move on? David Kozis. Right, thank you. Um, so at the beginning, Roshin said that there was one town, I don't remember which one, that responded much, much, much more frequently, like I think 11 times more than any other town. So I'm just, if we're gonna pull out and just separate the data, we don't wanna overstate or confuse things. We might wanna pull out that one town as a third category, perhaps. Yeah, I guess it, I guess that depends, right? Does it, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I, I think staff needs to look at that because I'm not sure whether we, whether we envision these as, as comments from people or comments from towns, right? So, so yeah, I take your point. They can skew the, they can skew the results, but that just may mean that they're involved in, and, and, and yeah. So I don't know, David, but yes, you're right. Regine and, Regine and Eric and Brian should think about that issue before and they- we, before we, consciously, they we, we consciously made the decision not to, to do something where there would only be one response from one community because we thought that was recreating the problem we have with the municipal elections is that there's like the only person who's responding is like the chair of the board of selectmen or something so we wanted to just cast a wide net and if 11 people from situate responded that's fine but we would figure out how to you know take that with a grain of salt so we, we will we'll, we'll do that and report that back accordingly thank you eric ken miller 
Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, that, that, that's a good point, David. I was going to suggest that too at, at the risk of asking for too much, but it, it would be great if it was stratified by uh, member communities versus non, uh, I'm sorry, MPO member versus non MPO member communities. And I was going to suggest that you do it. Uh, it's good to get the comments from everybody, Eric. That's great. That, you know, sure, the more the merrier. That's great. But in terms of the actual data and how you categorize things and percentages, uh, it would also I think also be illustrative to do it just based on uh, uh, by 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 towns also. So I think stratified by by member communities and non, and then also an additional cut would be in addition to just the general responses, also just do it by percentage of, of communities because you're right, one eighth of the responses are from six year one quarter of the responses are from NPO members. So I think that does that does sort of skew them. So yes, it, 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 I know I'm asking for it's more work, but I think it would be great if we could see both of those stratifications. Thank you. If, any other questions or comments on this? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I would just say one last thing is I I, I think you know we um, we will bring this information back. I don't know if it'll be at the next MPO meeting or, or when, but we'll work with staff to figure out when when we can bring that back soon. I do think though that um, you know I just want folks to be thinking that you know we like we do need to address do we make structural changes. So I just think people should think about that. At some point, we need to actually make a decision do we just keep the system the way we have or do we make any any changes and i don't know if that needs to be a motion or a vote or something like that but we 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 need to make some decision whether we make changes or not and what those changes are so i think people should just have like be thinking about that so that they can come prepared and if they need to vet that internally just you know please you know do some thinking about that because at, at, at probably the next time we discuss this we will actually ask for some type of a decision to be made or or a decision at some point. Thank you, Eric. Ken? So I guess Ken was just had his hand up. All right, so that, that ends that um, issue. The next issue is addressing priority quarters from the Long Range Transportation Plan Needs Assessment, Route 28. Before this starts, I unfortunately have to leave. I have a conflict at noon, so Eric will take the chair. And thanks everybody, and I'm sorry I've got to leave early. Thank you, Mr. Che. Good morning. My name is Seth Asante, and I'll be presenting the Route 28 Priority Corridor Study in Melton. The needs assessment of the current MPO Long Range Transportation Plan I identified several arterial segments that require improvements to address goal areas, such as safety, capacity management and mobility, and system preservation. To help identify solutions for some of the arterial segments, a roadway corridor study was included in the federal fiscal year 2020 Unified Planning Work Program. Roadway corridor studies are logical ways to address regional safety needs and multimodal transportation because they comprehensively consider the needs of people walking, biking, driving, or taking transit. The priority corridor studies uses this approach to improve an arterial segment. Next slide. The MPO staff selected Route 28 corridor in Melton for study, following a selection process that involved a review of safety conditions, congestion, and multimodal transportation, and also the potential for implementing the study recommendations. The study limits for the Route 28 study are from the city of Boston uh, city line at the intersection of Brook Road and Blue, and Blue Hills Parkway to the Quincy city line. It is about four miles long. The objectives and goal 
of the study are to improve safety for all users and transform an autocentric corridor into a route for everyone and also to develop short and long-term recommendation for safe access to school, transit, neighborhoods, and recreational areas. Next slide, please. The character and context changes along the roadway. To reflect the settings in the corridor needs and also in the development of improvement concepts, MPO staff divided the corridor into three segments for evaluation. They are the Broke Road segment, which is shown in the olive green color. The Ridge Day Road segment, which is also shown in the light green color. And the Randolph Avenue segment, shown in the deep green color. Next slide, please. These are the cross sections of the three segments. All three segments are four lane roadways, two lane in each direction. All three segments also have sidewalks, but there are many sections that are in poor conditions and do not meet mass, mass dot standards. Brook Road and Risdale Road have marked shared use lanes for biking. Randolph Avenue has no bicycle facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, could you please uh, click on the image? Yeah. For the next three slides, I'll be talking about uh, video clips of the tray segment. And this is the Brook Road segment, which is about 0.7 miles long. The area surrounding the Brook Road segment has mixed land uses, including residential, recreational, and educational. The PS Middle School, Kelly Field, and Brook Road Playground, as well as St. Mary's School, are located in the corridor. Parking is an issue in the segment because of school drop-off and pickup, and also insufficient parking for field and playground activities. People used to park in travel lanes during these times. Next slide, please. Please click on the image. This is the Rich Day Road segment. It's about one mile long. The area surrounding the Rich Day Road segment is residential. Also the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital and the Melton Public Library are located in the segment. Transit and pedestrian improvement were constructed in April 2020 at the hospital's driveway, including the installation of pedestrian hybrid beacon signal and also ADA compliant wheelchair ramps. Next slide, please. This is the Randolph Avenue segment. And the third segment in the corridor is about 1.8 miles long. The area surrounding the Randolph Avenue segment is primarily residential and recreational with some businesses also located in the segment. The Wollaston Golf Club and the Granite Links Golf Club are located in the corridor. The speed limits in this segment are very high, 40 miles per hour and also 45 miles per hour. There were four fatalities in the segment during the time period 2013 to 17, and many of the crashes involved injuries. Next slide, please. Stakeholder participation was a crucial part of this study. An advisory task force composed of representatives from the town of Milton, MassDOT, 
state legislators, a uh, representative Milton was established to guide the study. Staff met with the tax force two times to present the existing condition and also the improvement concepts for feedback. MPO staff also developed a survey to determine the public's opinion about concerns and problems on Route 28 and how to resolve this problem. The survey was very instrumental uh, in this study as it provided useful information about the problems and also the development of the improvement concepts. Next slide, please. There were 473 crashes in the corridor during the five year period. They included four fatalities, all on the Randolph Avenue segment. All the fatalities involved people in vehicles. Also, there were 189 non fatal injuries, nine walking and biking crashes, 302 intersection crashes, and 171 segment crashes, as well as 182 peak period crashes. Many of the crashes were also left turn related. And there are four intersections in the corridor that are highway safety improvement program crash clusters. Next slide, please. The amount of daily traffic volume in the corridor ranges from 18,000 vehicles per day to about 30,000 vehicles per day. The counts were adjusted for low traffic volumes during the pandemic. They were taken in October, 2020. We compared the October, 2020 counts to the April, 2014 counts taken within the corridor after applying a CCA growth factor to the 2014 counts. The adjustments we made were also guided by mass.covid 19 traffic volume monitoring. The Randolph Avenue segment carries the highest volume of traffic and Brook Road segment the lowest volume. The highest volume occurred on Randolph Avenue segment because major crossroad intersect Route 28 and connect to the Route 128 corridor and the Southeast Expressway. Next slide, please. These are the walking and biking volumes. The green circles with the numbers are the walking volumes. The pink circles with the numbers are the biking volumes. Walking and biking activities are highest on Brook Road and Risdale Road segments. And they are highlighted in the darker shade. And also they are the areas where the schools, the playgrounds and residences are located. The low volume on Randolph Avenue segment reflect the high vehicle speed and also high volumes and poor sidewalk condition in that segment. Next slide. Based on the existing conditions analysis, the community survey and also feedback from the advisory tax force, the top four corridor weaknesses are high number of crashes, an automobile centric corridor, lack of safe accommodation for walking and biking, high volumes and speed of vehicles, which makes it unsafe for people walking and biking. Next slide. These are the strengths of the corridor. They include opportunities to improve safety for everyone, to transform the road into a route for everyone, and also by doing so, 
improve the quality of life of the neighborhoods. Next slide, please. These are the needs of the corridor and also the focus areas where future investment should be focused. They include improve, improving safety and reducing crashes for all modes, high quality walking and biking facilities to calm traffic, reduce congestion and cut through traffic. Next slide, please. For the next slide, I'll be talking about the short-term improvement that MPO staff proposed for the corridor. Next slide, please. MPO staff recommended several short-term improvements for the corridor. They include, but not limited to the following. Upgrading the sidewalk and wheelchair ramps to MassDOT standards. Upgrading the signal equipment to improve safety, such as adding yellow retro reflective backplates, countdown timers, accessible pedestrian signals, as well as optimizing the signal timings to reduce congestion and pedestrian wait times, and reconfiguring approach lanes to reduce delays. Next slide, please. For the next few slides, I'll be describing the long-term improvements for the corridor. Next slide. Uh, please, uh, thank you. Last October, when the study was still in progress, the town of Melton used its shared streets and spaces grant to implement a road diet project on the Brook Road segment. The project on Brook Road segment converted it from a four lane road to a two lane road. The reconfiguration also added bike lane on either side of the road and parking at selected locations. The reconfiguration has addressed parking issues and improved connectivity and safety for people walking and biking. Next slide, please. The objectives of the long-term improvements for Brook Road segment were to address walking, biking, and parking is to support the schools and playgrounds in the segment. MPO staff developed three road diet concepts for the segment. In all three concepts, the four lane road is converted to a two lane road. All three concepts also have sidewalk and raised separated bike lane on either side of the road. Concept one shown here has parking on either side of the road at selected location. Next slide, please. Concept two for Brook Road is another variation of the road diet concept. It has a median which transition into left hand lanes to improve safety of left hand maneuvers. Parking is only on one side of the road in concept two. Next slide, please. This is concept three for Brook Road and is also an alternative variation of the road diet concept. It has a two way left turn lane to improve safety of left turning maneuvers into the side street and also driveways of abutting properties. In concept three, parking is only on one side of the road. Next slide. The intersection of Brook Road, Central Avenue, Risdale Road is one of the four highway safety improvement program crash clusters. It is congested during peak period. 
its five legs also make it difficult to navigate as drivers find the lane assignment confusing. MPU staff develop a runabout retrofit concept for the intersection to streamline traffic flow and reduce delays. Next slide. Okay, I think the next slide is not showing well. Or is it on my, okay. Yeah, okay. The objectives of the long term improvement for Risdale Road were similar to those for the Brook Road segment to accommodate walking and biking uh, um, modes, as well as calming traffic and reducing crashes. Concept one and two for Risdale Road converts the four lane road to a two lane road and have raised separated bike lane on either side of the road. Concept one shown here includes a two-way left turn lane and, and parking is only on one side of the road. Next slide. This is concept two for the Day Road. It's also an alternative of the road dye solution. It has similar configuration as concept one except that the two-way left-hand lane is replaced with a median, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that transitions into left-hand lanes at selected intersections to improve safety. Next slide. And, <clears throat> and this is concept three for Risdale Road. Concept three maintains the existing four lanes but reduces the width of the lanes and utilizes <clears throat> the existing shoulders to install a multi-use path on one side of the road and a sidewalk on the other side. This concept does not provide left turn lanes that will increase safety for left turning maneuvers. Next slide, please. The intersection of Randolph Avenue and Risdale Road is also an each zip crash cluster with many angle crashes. It's also congested during peak travel periods. MPO staff recommends a runabout retrofit for this intersection. Next slide, please. Now we move on to the Randolph Avenue segment. The Randolph Avenue segment has a lot of crashes. And as I mentioned, there were four fatalities, fatalities between 2013 and 2017. The corridor sees high volume of cut through traffic, trying to avoid congestion on Route 128 and the Southeast Expressway, which is a source of complaints by many of the residents in that corridor. Staff developed three concepts for the segment. Concept one and two maintains the four lanes and have multi-use path on one side of the road and a sidewalk on the other. Concept one shown here transform Randolph Road into a safer environment for walking and biking by adding the multi-use path. However, concept one does not provide the needed left turn lanes that will increase safety for left turn in maneuvers and also reduce crashes. Next slide. Thank you. Concept two reconfigures the four lanes to provide two lanes southbound and one lane northbound and a two way left turn lane that transition into exclusive left turn lanes at the major intersection. Concept two would improve safety and transform the corridor to accommodate walking and biking. It will also calm traffic and reduce the high speeds of vehicles, as well as improve safety by reducing the number of crashes, uh, uh, of left turn related crashes. Next slide, please. 
concept three was included in this study because there were many comments uh, from the community survey about keeping Randolph Avenue as a two lane, two way road. The four lane road is perceived by many residents to attract cut through traffic, avoiding congestion on Route 128 and the Southeast Expressway. Concept 3 has one travel lane in each direction and a two way left turn lane. The concept also has a raised separated bicycle lane and a sidewalk on either side of the road. This concept will also calm traffic, reduce high speeds of vehicle and the high number of crashes. However, it increases congestion. Next slide, please. Additional improvements on Randolph Avenue segment includes the installation of two traffic signals at two intersections. They are the Randolph Avenue at Allen Ave and also Randolph Avenue at Ridgewood Road. These two intersections and the roadway segment between them experience high number of crashes, including two fatalities and several injuries. And as I mentioned, many of the crashes were left and related. The new signals will help calm traffic, reduce high speeds, and also add additional crossing opportunities for people walking and biking. Next slide, please. And this ends my presentation. Thank you. And I will hand over to the chairman for questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Great job. Um, are there any questions or comments about uh, this work? Let's see, Steve Olinoff. Yes, uh, so it's pointed out in the survey, in this, in this study that uh, e even though the intersection of Chickatawbit Road and Randolph Avenue is in the study area, uh, the study does not include that intersection because it's being done as part of another uh, study. And so this is not directed to Seth, it's really to uh, mass stop planning because obviously the two things have to be coordinated. Uh, you have different options there for uh, either two lanes or one lane feeding in to where that uh, uh, roundabout would be. So the roundabout has to be des designed to, to match whether it's all going to be one, one uh, lane or, or two lanes. And another problem would be further down the road in constant construction is, is this construction going to be together or because one might be a mass stop project and the other might be a, 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 a town of Milton project. And, uh, and you wouldn't want to have a period of time where the, uh, uh, the lanes feeding into the traffic circle don't match up. Uh, it would be a, a real problem. So I was wondering what MassDOT is thinking about that. Seth, do you want to respond to any of that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the segment that Steve is talking about is the Randolph Avenue segment. And we had three concepts. One concept is kept the four uh, travel lanes, two in each direction, that uh, kind of marries well with the roundabout concept. The other two concepts with two lanes southbound and one lane northbound with left hand lane uh, will not match exactly with the roundabout, but somewhere along the corridor, there has to be either a lane merge to be able to uh, uh, merge with uh, the proposals that do not have two lanes in each direction. And the reason why we have this uh, 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 concept is because there were four fatalities and the four lanes, two lanes in each direction does not have any left turn lane. So drivers waiting to turn left into their residences 
and also driveways and other side streets. It's a big concern and people changing lanes. Uh, they were all involved in causing this uh, four fatalities in the segment. So the options that we created uh, could also be merged with the runabout, two lane runabout concept at Chikataba. But we also want to uh, propose improvement to be able to address the con uh, safety needs along the corridor. Yeah, I'm just concerned about the coordination between the two studies and the and is it going to be two construction projects that that needs to be coordinated so that it can be done right and that's what I've yeah, asked I asked about. Yeah, I think the Chikatabo one the project is uh, uh, has been uh, advertised, so that's that one is going ahead, and it was because of that reason that we didn't propose any improvement for the runabout because. It had, it's the perverse solution. So we didn't want to uh, touch that in order for it to be married with the proposal that we have improved. But they, has, they have to be separate projects. And also along the corridor, the Randolph Avenue segment is under mass dot jurisdiction. The Brook Road and Risdale Road are under the town jurisdiction. So that will also have to be resolved in phase uh, about how to uh, come out with a project to address that. Mark Abbott, did you want to add anything? I saw you had your hand raised. Can you unmute Mark? There we go. Yeah, um, Steve, uh, what Seth said, um, that they're well in the way of having design and implementation. So. Our quarter section will probably be a few years off looking for mass dot one make it a project and also get funding for it where the um that intersection chickatalba and uh randolph is already underway kind of in the process of construction so and the three concepts sets come up with will be able to tie into the roundabout um and they'll be able to make it work during the design of the the corridor that set proposes Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to call on uh, Senator Timothy. Hello, Eric, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay, hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Great, Eric, thank you very much. I'd love, first of all, I'd like to thank MPO for these proposals and Mr. Asante. Uh, uh, I also thank you for the invitation to address the gathering earlier. I actually had to jump on an urgent constituent call. Uh, that being said, uh, obviously this is very important, these proposals, and I emphasize they are proposals. Uh, I will reserve uh, further comment until I have a time to collaborate with my traffic commission in town and of course my constituents to uh, use these thoroughfares on a regular basis. But I just wanna say thank you very much. And obviously these proposals are productive. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. That's that's great. Um, Thank you. So let me call on uh, Len Diggins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, and and I'm quickly. I know it's late. And I just want to suggest I mean, uh, uh, that in the engagement section in Chapter Seven, uh, that you you do add um, uh, make the list of the participants a, a little more extensive because it wasn't clear to me who it was until I saw your slide. And then when I saw your slide and then saw that the full um, list of engagements and all that they had to say was in Appendix A. Uh, so that would be helpful. Uh, the other thing is I, um, oh, what's, uh, I kind of said this earlier on now, but I'll just repeat it quickly. It'd be really good to get this report uh, of a bigger audience because this is so good. And I think the people in that area uh, would really appreciate seeing the, the high quality of work that's in, and all the thought that's gone into this. And next, um, I'm, I'm thinking about the cost thing that we've been dealing with. And I'm kind of wondering out loud if, if projects, potential projects that have had this kind of uh, research done by the MPO uh, stand a better chance of of keeping their costs in line because if so, I think it's a it's a good thing and something we might want to incorporate. And lastly, you know, on um, the, the the proposals 
um, that had the two-way left turns. I'm kind of thinking back to the previous report that was done where it seemed like we were trying to get rid of those. Um, and I can understand that maybe this is an improvement over the status quo, but maybe I'm just a little bit confused and you don't have to go into it. It's, it's just something I kind of noticed and maybe I'll follow up with you and, and, and Mark just so that I can better understand how these work. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Len. Go ahead, Seth. Okay. Hey, I'll respond to Leonard say about the two way left hand lanes. Uh, they work in a, a specific conditions. Let's say if you have a segment that you have residences abutting uh, the roadway, several of them, and uh, they have to wait in traffic lanes to turn. Uh, those can be a good area that you can put the two-way left turn lane. If they are in the mid-block location and not up to the uh, intersection, but you do not have to extend the two-way left turn lane too long, else it becomes uh, an issue whereby people drive in them and can uh, create safety issue. So there are uh, a limitation uh, to how long you can make the left turn lane and you have to create them in such a way that it's just uh, uh, save the area or location that needs to be saved and not extended through the whole corridor. Thank you, Seth. Uh, let me call on Representative Bill Driscoll. Thank you very much. Uh, just wanted to uh, say thank you for the work. Uh, it's very helpful to look at the various uh, proposals and options. And I appreciate the, the detail that's in here and um, that each segment got um, you know, three options, uh, you know, proposals available because uh, that was one of my concerns in a previous iteration uh, as the project was going. So I, I really do appreciate that work and uh, showing different options. And um, my one question was, will this be available um, in the form of a website like previous corridor studies have appeared or how will this be available to the public, um, you know, kind of a static location? Yeah, it will, uh, it will be posted on the MPO website and I'll be sending a link to all the uh, project team members, the advisory task force one is put, once it's posted on the MPO website. So uh, you'll be able to download a copy of the report. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure um, a lot of constituents and the, the various departments in town will be interested. So thanks again. Thank you. Great. Great. Uh, and, and representative, thank you also for tuning in. We, re we really appreciate it when members of the legislature, um, you know, follow, follow our work. Are there any other questions or comments about this study? Okay, so seeing none, I would like to go on to member items. Are there any members items? I don't see anyone with their hand raised. I actually have a member's item, which is about the MPO municipal elections. And so um, appropriate for our conversation earlier today, um, this year, there are four seats up for election as there are every year. This year, we have the, um, the, uh, the town, the at-large uh, town seat that is currently held by the town of Arlington is up. The at-large city seat held by the city of Newton is up. The North Suburban uh, Planning Council seat held by the city of Woburn is up. And the Three Rivers Interlocal Council seat held by the town of Norwood is up. So those are the four seats that are up. I'll also be sending emails to those communities um, as well as getting all of that out um, broadly um, and, and really doubling down on the outreach um, per the survey we, we heard. So um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm happy to take them now. You can also uh, reach me uh, offline as, as well. So can I have a motion to adjourn? Len Diggins. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Tom Bent? I'll second that. 
Great. Um, so without objection, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all for a great meeting today. And we will uh, reconvene, I believe, on August 19th. Thank you.